Hello, everybody. And yet again, Zek has outdone himself. Whoa! It <laughs> is resist. Disability Horizons TV. It's live. It's six o'clock. It's Sunday. And strangely, I'm in control today. What's happened? It's Dan's turn to leave lost the show. Him. But Dan apparently is stuck somewhere in Southampton South in the bowling alley with a group of disabled children having a party. And it's all gone peak Tom. <laughs> so he will not be here. He will be apparently trying to calm children down as they I can or cannot bowl in a bowling alley that is always not accessible. I don't really know. The message that we got was garbled, but you could tell he was one stressed out father. Oh, so yes. I'm going to be doing the lead, uh, which means I get two bites of the cherry. <laughs> it's my show next time too. And we are of course joined by <laughs> Zek the Tech, who will be making the magic happen. Hello, Zek. Good evening. I, I'm going to start off. This may not be approved of. It may be approved of. We give the Tories a very big bashing on this show, and obviously, rightly so. But, you know, our local MP round here, unfortunately, met um, a very horrible end. I can't mm. imagine how scary that was. Oh, is he your MP? He's in a neighbouring yeah, yeah. Uh, constituency. Apparently a very nice man, even though his policies weren't as great you know that you're Tory but at the end of the day he was a human being who met a very horrible end and you know I just want to say that is awful no matter how nasty this gets how hurt we get even though this is being portrayed as uh terrorism at the moment that's never ever ever okay no no uh, ironically I actually uh met him when I was famous I used to do some fundraising for a wonderful family in Essex uh, who were raising money for their daughter who was um sort of had quite a serious illness and you know kind of i, I got to meet them and really like them when we'd go up for a, a charity events and, and david amys would always be at these events um oh, he yeah, did we, didn't, we yeah. didn't talk about politics obviously but he was a really great bloke and he was always there supporting his constituents so yeah you know it's it's not on we, we we're never gonna have a democracy if we allow this to happen no now with that in mind, and as that is a very historic moment, and it might, we'll see where it leads. Ooh, we're going to be like. talking, look at that, you see, professional. Oh. We're going to be talking about disability and history. And it, when Dan suggested it, there's only one person that we can invite onto the show when we're talking about that, and that is the wonderful Philippa Vincent Connolly. Hello, Philippa. Hi, Mick. It's brilliant to be here. I Can I just say, I love the green sleeves music at the beginning. It just sort of set the scene. That was fantastic. So thank well, you for that. It had to be, Zek, didn't it? Zek, you know, we know what your book's about. And soon, all of the viewers will, too. They will. Yay. <laughs> so we're going to be talking disability history, but we want to know a bit about you. So tell us a bit about yourself first. And then we're going to go diving in to your very area of expertise, um, mm. which is disability and the Tudor period book out now. So tell us about yourself, Philippa. Gosh, what do you want to know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was um, I was one of those miracle babies way back in um, 1970. I was born at 26 weeks and I weighed two pounds, two ounces. So less than a bag of sugar. My ha my head was as small as a tangerine, according to my father. And he could lay me entirely in the palm of his hand when I was born, which, you know, is quite amazing because way back then, 51 years ago, they did not have the technology to keep babies my size alive. So for some reason or another, I was meant to be here. Um, Apparently, I died about 10 times. They had to keep resuscitating me. I stayed in hospital for six months before I even saw daylight. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and I I've ended up with them um, being diagnosed with cerebral palsy because of the lack of oxygen to my brain when I was born. And, obviously, you have to have a certain amount of oxygen to make sure that everything works okay. Uh, and that was how I was. So I'm affected. My legs are affected. Um, I have only just discovered in the last sort of five years as well that I have dyspraxia and uh, dyscalculia. And the reason I found that out that was was because I trained as a teacher and I had to do the QTS skills tests. And I always thought I was just thick at maths. 
great at everything else and, and I had to get maths GCSE so I got that but then you had to go to like a driving test center and do these questions on computer in maths English and ICT you had 18 seconds to answer a certain percentage of questions and then if you didn't get them you couldn't be a teacher so I like I was on my fourth attempt at the maths and the university said to me, right, we're going to get you tested and see what's going on with your maths because we really need you to pass this. And this is when they discovered I had extra learning problems or learning difficulties, but it was all linked in with the cerebral palsy, which I never knew about. Yeah. But yeah. On, on the other hand, they also tested me and said that I had this amazing high IQ as well, which is now why I'm doing a PhD in disability history. It's not just the book. I'm doing a PhD with Manchester Metropolitan University at a distance. And um, we'll obviously go up to Manchester a few times. I'm getting getting myself really involved even in the first week, being a student rep and all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, so I'm hoping that from the research I did with my book, I will be able to delve deeper into that research and really find out, out some things that I didn't actually um, actually know about. You know, so it's funny, it's funny. You, you, you like you're saying you're going to go and study history of and disability. It's not something talked about much at universities and colleges, is it? Well, funnily enough, um, I today through, through Twitter and through the fact that we um, we put this up on on Twitter, somebody contacted me and said, "Oh, actually, I'm at Southampton and I'm doing disability history of the the Tudors as well." Wow. And, wow. and she lives about six or seven miles down the road from me. So, so we're going to connect and, and talk and share some research, even if she's in a different university. So that's fabulous. That's but good. I think what gets me about disability history is that it's always tagged on as an afterthought to other areas and specialisms. It's always a part of social history or it's always you know the last or final thought if you like. It's never really studied in its own right where we should have whole departments in universities who are looking at this as a subject within history, I, I feel, because and I'm not just saying that because I'm a disabled person, but it, the history of disabled people needs to be reclaimed back by disabled people because we are mentors and role models to other people who are unfortunately being born with disabilities or having to cope with disabilities later in life if that happens to them that way. You know, it's it's only through constant learning that we ever get any better with attitudes and all those sorts of things. So that's my belief around it. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do it. I mean, I, go on. No, I was gonna say, aha. I still can't work out where that sound's coming from. But anyway, um, we, we, when you become, especially, you know, I mean, I was like you, I, I was a historic baby. I was one of a test group of six to be given a new type of chemotherapy. And it's always weird. We kind of meet up online and go, oh, still here. Um, because before that, the tumor I had was kind of difficult to treat. It was about 99% terminal. And so we're a really weird little bunch. So even that is important. But I've. it's funny that that wasn't recorded very well. So actually, the history of the treatment I have isn't even in the medical books. It's in one medical book written by the doctor who treated me, but wasn't carried on. So it's weird that disability history just does seem to fall between the cracks. Well, it's so a, many historic figures were disabled, weren't they? Yeah, How well, do we find out? I mean, if, if would you find it researching ancestry? Is it? It locked anywhere, is it? I mean, there, ah, well, that's what we need. That's what we got Philippa on for because she knows how to do it. That's Tell true. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the problem being with disability history, or well, what I've come, you know, across in my initial research for the book, was that in particularly in the early modern period, the Tudors is they were only just beginning to categorise certain disabilities. So they would actually describe what they saw. So if you were lame, for example, you'd be called a cripple. If you were blind and deaf, that's what you'd be called. If you had some sort of an intellectual disability, you'd be called mad or an idiot or you'd be a natural fool. So the terminology isn't fabulous, but you've got to remember, you've got to look at 
the subject the in context from the time. There's no yeah, point yeah. looking at it through rose-tinted spectacles and putting our political correctness on it because it doesn't work. Um, so people buying the book, looking, thinking they're going to find all sorts of information about different syndromes that are around today, they're not going to, purely because those kinds of disabilities weren't recorded, they didn't have the medical knowledge to deal with them, and so for somebody like myself or you, Mick, yeah. I dare yeah. I say it, we wouldn't have survived, <laughs> we wouldn't have existed. But that'd be funny for the, if I'd have been born a week earlier, I'd be dead. <laughs> That's how much my history is, you know, kind of like, timing mattered. Mm, well, I, I feel as if, I, if I'd have been born in the 60s, for example, mm. just a decade earlier, I wouldn't have existed. I mean, my my parents were approached to go in the Guinness Book of Records as being the smallest surviving baby in that, that year. But as you were talking about records, funnily enough, the hospital lost all my records as well. Yes, yeah, so yeah. before, you know... Um, when you before you get to 18 you can c claim for medical mishaps and things like that if my parents had been savvy they would have been able to claim for me being so small and all the problems that i had associated with cerebral palsy and i would have got some extra financial help but things were different then and you didn't know about all of that so hey ho <laughs> i'm plowing my way forward myself i have exactly the same as well my, my um spinal cord injury was caused by a doctor not spotting that my spine was collapsing and because back then people were much more deferential to the medical profession my parents never thought to challenge it um and it was only many years later i found in my, in my notes the notes they've got left that there was a letter saying oh during a surgery we accidentally severed the nerves to his right leg so, so the reason why I can't walk is partly my spinal collapse and partly because of the surgery they did to fix it, which was nice. But this is the thing, is that we've all got our histories around disability and we think we're alone. And yet, like you know, it, it, it's always been there. When you're, when you're looking at the Tudor history, what were the attitudes around disability back then? What was it like to, what did people view you as because you were, disabled was did that was that even a word not really mm. as i said to you um the tudors would just describe what they saw and they took you on face value you know that was the wonderful thing about it is because we weren't labeled and put into all these different boxes like we are now so you were just taken as the person that you are you know and and that's that's the way they looked at it which is to me is quite refreshing about it but they had two diff very different viewpoints based on religion and superstition right and um also depending on where you lived and what sort of family and what sort of social status you were born into also depended on how you were treated and, and what kind of life you, you led if that does that make sense so you've got oh, yeah. that kind of sort of umbrella of things going on so for example um their superstitions were still a bit into witchcraft they were still a bit into sort of weird and wonderful things like the um malleus book you know which witch hunting and everything so you know if you if you had a deformed baby for example then you must be involved in witchcraft or there must have been a sin in a past life of your parents. So was this by the church? church. Um, this was general, general superstition, just right. general, you know, and folk folklore that had been passed down time and time through the generations, and also partly by the church. Um, and so therefore, you had that sort of idea that if you weren't physically normal or intellectually normal, then there was some kind of problem where where did that problem originate from and and obviously they, they put it on a religious sense into the sins in your past life or things like that to be able to explain it because there was no other way they could explain it they didn't know, they, they didn't know. and then on the other hand you had um, disabled people going and living in with noble families and with the upper classes who through their charitable work and their charitable giving through the church would take disabled pe people in, support them, clothe them, feed them, educate them 
and they would sort of consider them important because I don't know whether you, you know you've been around people with Down syndrome syndrome for example my uncle um, used to run a, a community in um, Ringwood in Dorset where he would look after adults with Down syndrome and they have the most wonderful way of just saying whatever's on their mind there's no filter there's no judgment they'll just come out and say whatever they think and people like that around noble families around henry the eighth they were valued because they had that ability these people had no agenda going on about oh i, I want to get close to the king or close to this family because i want money i want power i want status they were just being themselves and so therefore what would happen is the Tudors would then think that these people, because they spoke the truth, they had some kind of direct line to God, that the Holy Spirit would speak through them. So they were completely speaking the truth. They were considered, they were honoured. They weren't holy, but they were considered really important. I mean, Henry VIII, for example, had several um disabled people around him and he would sometimes lock out all of his other privy councillors and just have these disabled people in his presence and would talk to them before he talked to anybody else well i guess back then it was like who can i trust yeah, exactly you know, yeah, so that you know yeah um but wasn't henry the eighth himself what we would now call disabled didn't he get injured in a jousting competition and then because of the medical treatment being let's say dodgy it, 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 this infection grew he became and that's part of the reason why he got so big it, and, right. it's, it, and it's because i know i read that somewhere that, that there are you know I mean, maybe not then he was called disabled but we would call him disabled and actually mm. that was that then became into the idea that disabled people were weak so he had to try and prove that he was strong and you know and all this kind of panic around having kids uh, and it's funny the number. I mean, you know, I, you know, I've done a lot of research on this for a uh, for a TV show that never got commissioned because the BBC said no one would want to watch it. Let's hope that changes. And there are loads of people in history, big big historic figures, who we would call disabled, who that bit of has been ignored, either by historians or by the people that wrote the history. You know, either as it happened or shortly after. Mm. So, does it make your job really hard to try and find? about well not, the, in, not the, in the, the common man but the historic characters um, all of it because history if you remember is always written by the victorious people <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. so if you if you were writing about somebody that had issues whether it be physical emotional intellectual then they'd always be seen as a bit of a problem and not on the winning side so you know they didn't want it to shout about their issues, for example. Like we didn't know about poor old Richard III with his scoliosis until we discovered his skeleton. But he still managed to ride into battle. He still managed to do all the things that he did. So he kept his his problems very quiet. But there are historians out there who say Richard III wasn't disabled. Scoliosis can't be counted as a disability, which is something I talk about in, in my book. Um, but with Henry VIII, um, when he was very young, he was very athletic, mm -hmm. very fit. He was six foot two. He was one of the tallest men at court because Tudor men were only about five foot eight at the tallest, you know? So he was considered, well, hey, you know, a bit of an athlete, a bit, you know, he'd do everything. He'd, he'd joust, he'd, he'd hunt, he'd go hawking, he'd do everything. Tennis, the, the whole kit and caboodle. He'd wear out seven horses in a day in a hunt. So, you know, he was he was at the his physical prime when he was a lot younger. And basically what happened was um, he had several accidents uh, in his lifetime. One where he tried to pull vault, vault over um, a stream or a river during a hunt, hunting trip and ended up face down in the mud and nearly drowned. Um, there was other other things where he injured himself playing tennis, for example, and to because his foot was so swollen, he had to wear a normal leather shoe on one foot and a silk slipper on the other. And then it became like fashionable in court around that time for everybody to wear one leather shoe and one silk shoe. Do you know what I mean? To keep up with the king sort of thing and not make him feel uncomfortable. Um, but the the joust of because um, he had a really bad joust in um, March um, fifteen twenty four, 
where he was jousting against um, the Duke of Suffolk, Charles Brandon, his best friend. He left his visor up. Brandon goes with the lance straight at him and it goes, just sort of misses his eye. And, you know, he's, you know, so there was that one where I would like to think that perhaps that's when his capacity his mental capacity slowly began to dwindle i don't think it all came from the 1536 joust but in 15 january 1536 he's he's jousting at greenwich and a horse falls on his leg yeah and he's had an, an ulcer injury on his on his leg um for before and the fall opens up that that ulcer again there's different reports from different ambassadors. Some say that he was unconscious for two hours. Some people say that he was fully conscious and he was speaking. You know, it depends on what, which account you read. If it's the Spanish account, then he was unconscious. If it's other accounts, then he wasn't. Um, you know, so it's very hard to say. Um, but obviously, after that joust, he'd become quite obese anyway. He'd start started to put on a lot of weight he was on a a diet of meat and fish all the time hardly any vegetables because they considered that peasant food so you don't eat peasant food you have all the best you possibly can sugar was slowly beginning to come in you had marzipan castles and dishes and all sorts of things and subtleties made up all the time so they had a huge gluttonous diet if you've been around Hampton Court and you've been into the kitchens, you know, some of the guys, you can watch them cooking things there. And I've talked to them about the food and, you know, very rich diet. So, of course, Henry did put on weight and the more his ulcers were playing out, the less active he became. And so the more weight he put on and da, da, da. And it just That's goes right. on like a roller coaster. So eventually, sort of towards the end of his reign, he's got a 54 inch waist when he'd been pretty athletic. So he's trying to sort of carry around this bulky frame, this extra weight. Um, in his inventory of goods, there are walking sticks with whistles on it. There are three wheelchairs with tassels and velvet and all sorts on them. There's also a stunner stair lift, which gets him up and down the staircase at Whitehall Palace. There's 26 steps. When I, I, I went to a festival in Wimborne and I was to hear David Starkey speak and I went over and had a chat with him about it. And I said, look, I said, how do you think they could possibly make a Stanis stair lift for Henry VIII? He said, well, it must have been a bit like a, a wheel and pulley system where you'd put cargo onto ships, you know, on and off ships, that kind of thing. So that's sort of how I sort of envis envisaged it. Um, so, but the great thing about it is that Henry liked to keep all this side of his life really quiet. So it was only the people in his um, privy chamber that knew he had this the stair lift, that knew that he had this wheel, these wheelchairs and these walking canes with whistles on. He also had a megaphone. So if he fell over and he was on his own, which was probably probably very very rare. He'd, he'd get bellow through this megaphone and say, come on, lads, come and help me up. But oh, my God, just, I'm Henry VIII. You, the <laughs> you are. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I was just thinking, this is great for me because it means finally, as I get older, I've got that acting role to look forward to. I can play <laughs> the old Henry. <laughs> but the thing is, the thing is, not just one courtier would be there to help him up. He'd maybe have to have three or four because he's just like so heavy, which is not very dignified for a monarch. You know, he, his, his eyesight was also failing. That You know, some historians now have suggested that he might have had diabetes and extra other, you know, heart problems and all that because of his weight. So, you know, the poor guy's, like, deteriorating rapidly. Mm. And he's not accepting the fact that he's got to use disability aids to get around. He wants to be seen as the young Henry as he always used to be. But the trouble is... The trouble is, you could smell him walking down the corridor before you saw him because the ulcer was so putrid and rotten and horrible. And this, I think that this is what's... Because you know, this man made a huge difference to our society, to, to British society. And like with you highlighting this and making sure that people know this, you then can say, well, how much did this play 
a role in his choices and are we and i think that all through history i mean you know you we've talked about this haven't we yeah there are there are other historic characters like julius caesar like napoleon um uh, agnaton and tutankhamun who are also similar but they're not ever recorded as being disabled but when you mm. look into the the peripheral history you notice ah they must have had epilepsy they had this they had that ah and then yeah. you go ah what did that society because like you said in henry VIII hid it so hiding was important to him some societies were not that like that and some were so how mm. did that shape that and i think this is a massive area of study but you know, I'm over the, the moon other... that people like you are going into because it's going to be it's going to blow the doors off history as we know it. The other really important thing is to consider. I mean, I'm I, I guess having a disability myself makes me look at this research through a slightly different prism. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm biased towards it or against it one way or another, because obviously I've I've got to be neutral in my research. But it also makes me think of, you know, when you're disabled, when you've got things going on with your health, you're in pain. And pain is really, really awful in affecting your mood. I mean, you know it, Mick. If you're in a lot of pain one day, you can't do anything. You don't feel like doing anything. I bet you snap at Diane sometimes because the pain gets at you. I never. No. No. <laughs> No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, Mick. I know, I know, I know myself, if I, I'll go, give you an example, I went and walked around Kensington Palace last week, bearing in mind that during most of the lockdown, I've just been doing research yeah, yeah. and I've been at home and haven't been out. For me, walking around a lot causes me a lot of pain. So I've got the, like, the pedometer thing on my iPhone <laughs> and I'm like walking around, we managed to get parked into in the, the park near the Albert Memorial, but we had a long walk from the Albert Memorial to Kensington Palace to get to see what we were going to look at. And it was a killer. And I was literally, I mean, I don't, I haven't used a walking stick all my life until the last sort of year and a half. So I had my sparkly walking stick with me that's covered in rhinestones, gotta be posh, you know, gotta be with it. <laughs> and even using that, I was in absolute agony and I looked on my phone and I'd done about 7,000 steps. And for me, that's a lot. Um, and it, it took me about four days to recover. I was in so much pain afterwards. And I was grumpy with my sons. I was, you know, grumpy with my friends on social media, stuff yep. like that. Yeah, my so family I, was grumpy. Okay. So, yeah, so really... I could completely understand why Henry did some of the things he did later in life. Mm -hmm. Because if his health was failing so much and he was in a lot of pain, that's going to affect your decisions. Kill him. Just take him to the town and kill him. <laughs> Off with her head. Off with her head. You know what? It's but funny, though. because It's a valid point. Is that is that they're in so because the, I, I entirely agree that they, you've got all these people that are in different that've got different illnesses and impairments that are making them <coughs> not how do we maybe not making the best choices every now and again in societies that sometimes say if you admit to being disabled then you are weak and we will get rid of you so not only are they making bad choices but they're permanently trying to hide who they are and yeah. I mean, it's funny because like the Viking histories and about like Eric the Boneless, that's a real character. He was, uh, you know, a, a wonderful tactician in battle. So even though this person is, is believed to have brittle bones, he was marched in on a shield at the head of the Viking army and his plans helped the Vikings win and became, you know, doing, you know, rule huge swathes of England for a start. And that again, so, so there you've got someone who's honoured for being disabled and and again it was partly like you said about this idea of being in touch with spirits and i know mm. that in the egyptian society they believed that a lot of impairments were to do with getting ready for the next life in the art uh, in the in the old other world you know mm. so it's it's going to be you know i'm really looking forward to this because i've always been fascinated by this and the idea that this is going to blow up and become something new is fantastic at which point i'm going to pull us because we've only got a quarter of an hour left, into some into more that. modern history. <laughs> Look at that, see? Uh, this, this is <laughs> Time travel. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah, this, this in the industry is called a segue. That was a very okay. slow and horrible segue. But anyway, <laughs> what, 
Because something I think that, you know, I know Dan wanted to talk about was that, that one of the big events in, in, you know, in recent history around disability was around the Holocaust. For and sure. the fact that, yeah. you know, we, we have this sort of, uh, we talk, everyone talks about it a lot, but very few people talk about, you know, the Actian T4, the, the whole policy of, of, of painting disabled people as, you know, as useless as, as a drain on society and trying to clean and how much that has impacted on our modern way of thinking. Don't Did get you... me started. <laughs> well, please do, because we've got 15 minutes. <laughs> do, I mean, what, you know, is this somewhere that, something that you, you're thinking of looking at in, well, in your obviously... career? Well, obviously... I know you're doing the Victorians next, but yeah. after that, are you, are you going to do more modern sort of history well i'd like to do disability in the stuarts disability in the georgians but i've also got to do my phd um you know i've got different theories about different time periods so just going to see how it goes really and 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 how i get on with it um but with you talking about the holocaust um i've been in the fortunate situation where as a secondary school teacher i've been in history lessons where we've taught about the holocaust and we do talk a little bit about the discrimination of the disabled during, you know, the interwar years, you know, the early 1930s in Hitler's Germany, for example, and how um, people were put into hospitals and institutions and how their parents weren't contacted and they were just euthanized and got rid of um, because they were, you know, surplus to society's requirements. And it was only the lucky few whose parents had been contacted, whose parents then came and got their children or their relatives out of those institutions to be looked after at home. Hmm. But it's funny, it's funny. what's never talked about is is the fact that the the German people, when this started, when when the policy of of euthanizing disabled children, especially, started, the German people rose up and they marched in the street. It was the only time during the Nazi. Uh, and it sort of taught the Nazi government that they need to keep things much more quiet yeah. than they were at the start. And the, the, the parents and all the family, because this was this was their children, this was people they knew. Yeah. So they marched in the street, they stopped it. And that's when, like you said, this policy of saying, oh, well, we need to put your child into hospital, into care. And then they vanished. Oh, they've died of, a, of pneumonia. And it wasn't. They were being euthanized. Well, yeah, I mean, it, people you know, seem to you know, think, you know, you know people... It, uh, People talk about, you know, all the Holocaust, the Shoah, as it's known, and all this. But even before then, you know, those years yeah. leading up to it, there was a lot of awful stuff happening. And that isn't discussed. You know, they discussed the Holocaust, but they don't talk about the demonising of, you know, the Jews, of disabled people, of, you know, people who are black, Roman, Egyptians, the whole lot way before that even kicked and off. And also, they don't talk about the fact that it wasn't Germany that did it as well. Don't forget the Americans were sterilising disabled people during World War II. Yeah. That we were as well. You know, and, and without being funny, you know, in Imperial China, right up until the revolution, it was a, um, a parental responsibility that if you had a disabled child, you, you killed it. You took it outside and there were special places to take these children to let them die. You know, and it was kind of taking them onto a hill to let get rid of them, and yeah. and so it, it's it, again we're back to the idea that if you know about the history and you know about how societal attitudes impacted on people, you understand why it took hold and you know, why you... we've still got attitudes in society that we've got today exactly. that you and yeah. I are still fighting against. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so. So that, we, we can't really go into it too much. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that once you start talking about it, it becomes so Do you know what? Let's end, let's end on a really positive note. We've got, we've, we've got quite a while yet, Philip, but you've got yeah. 10 minutes. Yeah, we, but we can, we, we we can talk about... We can't end No, we can talk about this. We can talk about this. To me, my research is about being really positive. It's not looking at the really depressing side of the history. Yes, we have to talk about things like how, the Holocaust and how disabled people are treated, but you know, let's use our platforms for to help change attitudes, to help show that disabled people have got a lot to contribute into in society. Let's show that we can change attitudes. I mean, you're talking about them sterilizing disabled people. I, if I'd have been born in the Tudor times and had survived, would have been showered with gold and silver, dressed in silk. You know why? Because I had two gorgeous, healthy boys. Mm -hmm. And that would have been really important. You know, so 
we you've got to be really positive about about it and and you know like when i'm walking down the street for example i get stared at by people i get stared at by people's kids and i've noticed it before and i used to let it go over my head and not think about it but now i i sort of like deal with it head on it's like um once i can recall i was walking out of a shopping center and i could hear this little girl say to her mum oh mum why does that woman walk like that why is that lady walking like that and i stopped and i thought right what do i do I turned around, I tried to get down to the little girl's level and I explained. I explained why I was that I was born small and that I weighed less than a bag of sugar and all that kind of thing. And, and I said, and and the, the hospital tried to help me and they gave me too much or too little oxygen, which then affected the way I walk. And she was like, Oh right. And the parent was sort of stood there, mouth open, absolutely dumbfounded. And I looked at them and I said, Look, if you do not explain to people about yeah. disability they're never going to understand and so I, I, and I've, I've been like that for quite some time whereas when my mum was alive bless her we'd walk through a shopping center for example she'd see teenagers laughing at me when i was a teenager or whatever probably nothing to do with the fact that i was dressed as a punk probably to do with my walking <laughs> but anyway she 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 i can remember her having an altercation with a group of teenagers sat in the wimpy who'd been laughing at me through the window and i'm like going mum stop don't go in there don't go in there but she goes striding on in there how would you like to be built like that how would you like to walk like that make sure you you know if you've got something to say make sure it's nice <laughs> and then we'd walk off my mum was a brilliant ag- advocate for things like that but you've you know, you've got to speak up and you've got to say things and you've got to to make a difference to change attitudes. I think that was the thing is, is that you're like the work to any work that makes disability normalized and makes it so that it sits in history. Because like you said, you know, not only were we there, we've always been there. That's just mm-hmm. part of biology, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we could talk about the fact that you know you need blindness to evolve if you go into a cave and all this stuff, but it's always been there. Biology will make disabled people, that's it, right? And that we haven't all just been poor little things that needed looking after. Some of no. us have risen to positions of the highest power, whether we became disabled through injury or illness, or whether we were born that way that's the point and if you teach that in schools then at least you know when you're taking going ha 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 you know you can't do this you turn around and say oh and that's just like that famous historic figure you know it's not all about paralympians no (laughs) i've got got my paralympian high horse again the other great thing is though mick myself as a disabled teacher when i was doing my training and when i go on supply teaching and all that kind of thing they see me with my walking stick and it takes them a while and they'll take the mickey out of me for a time and then I'll take a couple of them aside and I'll have the conversation with them and then they're fine and then they understand. And I've done assemblies on diversity and talked about disability, you know, to whole schools when I've been in whatever school I've been in, you know, as part of my teacher training. And, you know, students see me as somebody like them if they've got challenges and they think, well, if she can do it, I can do it. And that's that's my my music teacher, Mr. Murphy, uh, had polio and Mm. and he walked with a caliper and I walked with a caliper at school. And I remember, I mean, we didn't get on because he said I was tone deaf, which of course I proved him wrong. And my (laughs) mum's until he died, until my mum died as well, she'd go up to the school and go, Oh, my son's just done this. You said he was tone deaf. So it was he used to see her come in and run the other way, which was tough when you couldn't walk very well. Um, but he taught me. I remember seeing him and thinking, well, if you can be a teacher, you know, I can do that, you know, that, that, and that's one of the things about seeing yourself, again, seeing yourself in history. If you're, mm. if you're always portrayed as, you know, kind of children in need, poor little things, then that's bad. And that helps, but, that damages but you. But do you know what, yeah. do you know what frustrates me though? I qualified in 2014. Mm. I still haven't got a permanent job mm. because I get sidelined the school say oh that the other people we interviewed have got more experience and that's their easy way of getting out of saying we don't really want to have to deal with or make adjustments for a disabled person to teach in our school because the school should be making those 
adjustments for the pupils anyway. So actually, it makes more. You know, what what is it that you're going to do that's so horrendous for a teacher? <laughs> the fact that I'm the, the fact that I'm not going to be able to run fast enough if a fire alarm goes off. But then, oh, but, but then, do what they did with me. Put you on the ground floor. Yeah. Oh, when I when I was at school at sixth form and at art college, all I my mean, lessons were moved downstairs. To be fair, so. some schools did make adjustments, but. A permanent job has eluded me, which is now why I'm writing, why now I'm doing my PhD, because I've sort of given up the idea of ever being a teacher in a, in a state school now, because it, attitudes just haven't moved with the time, sad to say. I know it's not every single school, but, what, you know, from what I've experienced, that's how it's been. I mean, we've had some, some amazing guests on, uh, professionals, from, well, we've had uh, uh, Grace, was it, who's yeah, a, doctor. Grace, a doctor. She's now yeah. a paediatric doctor. Yeah. Uh, George is a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ted Speakers, Elizabeth, is a Ted Speaker and author. And, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. there are a lot of pe – people don't see that, but there are a hell of a lot of very successful disabled people in life. Yeah, and that's what, that's what we need to, people to see more of so we can get attitudes to change and this is why history is so important so we can look back and see these amazing people from all periods of history not just the tudor period yeah. and, and see how amazing these disabled people were and say hang on a minute you know let's rethink this Plus I'm, gonna, book. I'm gonna say again you see uh, about history as uh, part of the disability history of the media that's been forgotten. Yes, I'm going to bring up the Emmy again. Um, but that's <laughs> surely not, Mick. But, you know, I was part of a cohort of young disabled people in the 80s and 90s who presented television, who got really massive, who then got dropped, and the television went, let's do another talent search, and then another one, and then another one. And now people go, oh, well, there wasn't anyone on, dis on television that was disabled in the 80s and 90s. And it's like, yeah, there were, there were loads. It's just that history has forgotten us because history is written, as Philippa so rightly pointed out, by the winners. And the media don't want to be the people that went, well, we had a load of talent, but we let them go. But so actually, 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 let's be, I'm going to be positive again. Because I, I have actually, I am on a shortlist to be a TV presenter. I'm just waiting for jobs to come in. But so you imagine, imagine though, Philippa, you're going to be doing history and television. I, I, I was part of a BBC programme about the history of disability, like the big characters we're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. That was being written in 1994. Mm. And the BBC Big Week said, no one wants to watch a programme about disabled people in history. No one will believe it, right? So what I'm saying is, is that the, the history, we're making change. And positively, like you said, that is good. It's going to be brilliant. But we could be so much further along if our history hadn't have been forgotten and that we of could course. be open about those barriers. So let's hope that we can see more of you. But what before we go, let's just round out all the other things you're doing, because I know that you're doing something else. A and book. Editing, not only a book. Oh, yes, you've got your... In fact, let's talk about that yeah. first, because we've only got three minutes. So, so aren't there you an go. author? You're an author. Here's the book, yeah. folks. Quick, cut to that That's my, That's my, that's my um, fictional series. I've got four books in the series. The first one's been really successful. We have got a disabled character in there called Jane Fall, who was actually part of the Tudor Court. Um, and I've put, I've written her as a, as a Down syndrome person um so she is in the book and how Anne takes her to court with her and looks after her Anne Boleyn that is but it's about a 21st century history student who time travels back to the Boleyns and to the Tudors and how she interacts with them all and does she change history or not and but, you know, but, but it's it's four books it's four books Trump. this is this is the first one um and it's um it's on Amazon it's self-published but I have got two potential big mainstream publishers interested in the whole series just waiting to, all of our fingers uh, waiting to, our waiting to hear waiting to hear i'm hoping it will be made into a super amazon or netflix series <laughs> let's well, see good. let's see what happens do they need a, a, a fat old henry the eighth in a wheelchair because i happen to know one that's perfect <laughs> <laughs> ho, ho, ho. off with the head <laughs> Now, before we go, there is one more thing that I'm going to mention that you're doing, Philip, because you're editing, and this is kind of historic. 
Yeah. <laughs> magazine it is now <laughs> which is about the 80s music scene and yes. i know because i'm your one of your staff writers so yes, tell us are. about that because it's coming out soon isn't it gosh well in the 80s i used to dress as a goth and a punk partly to hide my disability i thought people would look more at my clothes and more at what, what i look like rather than the way i walk so i was very into mark Harmon, soft cell culture club visage human league all of that anyway i wrote a piece a blog on Rusty Egan because um, I asked him some questions. I was hoping to interview him for my podcast, but he was too busy. So I asked him questions instead. And I wrote it up as an article on my website. I put it on social media. And this guy from Silverback Publishing, Tom, um, got in contact with me and said, we are looking for an editor in chief for an 80 specific magazine. Would you like to do it? And I said, of course, I'd love to do it. And the rest is history. The first issue comes out on the 4th of November, but it's not just going to be a music magazine. We're looking at um, 80s history in terms of fashion, music, artists, the actual social history, a bit of the politics. We're looking at everything you could possibly imagine. And it's going to be absolutely fascinating because it's rather sad that 40 years ago is now considered contemporary history. And the fact that I actually lived through it, I'm like feeling a little bit old now. And, and I'm <laughs> but, very happy. But, I, I mean, the wonderful thing about it is I've got some amazing opportunities coming up interviewing some of my all time heroes. And I can't divulge names at the moment. You'll have to get the magazine and the subscription. But I am so excited. I can't tell you. And I've got to real keep my cool and my calm and not fangirl around anybody <laughs> if you get my drift. Oh, yeah. But we've got competitions all sorts of things going in the magazine interviews all sorts reviews of albums past and present new bands that are influenced by the 1980s and we're in we're interviewing some vintage artists i interviewed martin ware from heaven 17 in the bef which was really amazing and we talked a little bit about history because he's also done some musical interludes for um the foundling museum for example so that was quite interesting talking to him and yeah. um yeah. and you've I'm also really commissioned me to write an article about the history of disability in the 80s which i'm going to be i've already got an interview with penny pepper because she did go to the blitz so i've yeah. got a disabled person that went to the blitz to be interviewed and it's yeah and it's like you said, it's going to be a positive kind of. It's not a downer. It's a and well, like you said, for, we're doing everything. Me, aren't we? It's going to be great for me. The blitz, the blitz scene, and the blitz kids, and everything were all about being exclusive and welcoming mm -hmm. to everybody from every walk of life, whatever your sexuality, whatever was different about you, it was welcomed because that was the whole ethos of the place, and so that's why I wanted to put that in as a, to a topic. I know there were loads of stairs in the Blitz because I've been taught by people that yeah, went no, there. Yeah. <laughs> but and then there were I loads know. of stairs in the Camden Palace yeah. and the Hard Club and all the other ones. So yeah, I like to think, although I was like 11 in 1980, 81, I came across the Blitz through the Cameras Go Crazy um, book on Culture Club and Boy George. And I was hooked ever since after reading that because I was a huge Culture Club fan and Boy George fan. I still am. And I like to think if I'd have been that slightly bit older and gone into the Blitz Club, that Steve Stranger would have welcomed me in because of being different. That's what well, I like I, to I, think. I actually got welcomed into the Mud Club by Philip Salon. Did you? So, uh, yeah, I, um, uh, my friends, he went, none of you lot can come in. He went, he can come in though. Uh, oh, and yes. my friend said, "Well, who's going to carry him down the stairs then?" <laughs> and they went, and he went, "All right, well, as long as you only, as long as you carry him down the stairs, and then don't get, you're not allowed to mix with anyone because you're just too uncool." And what? we're going to have to wrap it but, up uh, because we are we're hitting friend, fifty minutes. Just, uh, do you know what? Right, I was just going to say that um, I noticed that uh, Zek made my picture big and then didn't shrink it down again, and that was his subtle hint to say, "Come on, Mick, end the show." So I am ending the show. Thank you so much, Philip. <laughs> You've been fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Don't forget, thank you, Philip. Uh, Visibility and the Tudors is out. The Timeless Falcon is out. Watch out for Philip. He's going to be all over the place. Um, <laughs> Zek and me are back next time with Dan. Hopefully, unless he's off doing trick or treating. Oh, I'm looking forward um, to this. Because next time we do it, it's me again, I'm afraid, folks, uh, with um, disability horror stories. I mean, on we're Halloween. Gonna, we're, we're a Halloween special. We're all going to get made up. Ooh. 
people and we want you to uh, write in, ring in, email us, whatever, with your stories that we can tell as horror <laughs> stories. And with that, we wish you all a wonderful good night. Night. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. Hit the button, Dick.